There's a song in my heart from summers long ago spent here in Tyler, Minnesota. I remember well many a day like this. I can still feel the heat on my neck, the chafe sticking down inside my t-shirt as we're catching bales and loading them onto a wagon. We're lucky to find a scene like this in Tyler today, baling straw in the same old school method as it was done 50 years ago. Things are changing here in the heartland. Will this little Danish town on the prairie make it through another hundred years? Tyler, Minnesota seems like it's a long way from nowhere. <laughs> it's, it's in a wonderful part of the state of Minnesota, but often forgotten about part of the state of Minnesota, and that is the southwestern portion of the state. It feels very much like you're in the middle of nowhere, and I mean that in a very kind way. Uh, that's a nice feeling. It's a nice feeling to, to feel that you're away from things. Scott Thompson, like me, is only a part-time visitor to Tyler. He's the grandson of my mom's dentist. When you drive down to Tyler from the Twin Cities, for example, or a metropolitan area, you go through the, the, the country, all the farms, and in a sense it feels like you're out in the ocean. Uh, there's an infinite sensation that you get being in farm country. The, the sky is big. It feels like you can see almost forever in any direction you look. And it's a town of, what, 12, 1,300 people right now. Uh, it was first formed basically back in the late 1800s as a strictly Danish community. And even to this day in the uh, 2000s, it's uh, still heavily influenced by Danish, but certainly has lost a lot of its, its uh, Danish culture and heritage in terms of the actual population. I would guess that not even 50% of the population is Danish-based. Returning here now after more than 50 years, I find that some things just haven't changed. For instance, the kids of Lincoln County preparing their animals for the annual Lincoln County Fair now in its hundredth year. Well, the, this whole week is pretty busy for the kids in 4-H, whether they have livestock or not. If they don't have livestock, they might be getting their vegetables ready or finishing up on art projects or framing the photography, any sort of project. But then there's This is Amanda livestock. Buell, a graduating senior this year at the local high school. She has one foot in both worlds, the Tyler of yesteryear, and the Tyler of today. She's the granddaughter of choir master Agnita Buell, a true keeper of the flame, who among many other things, plays traditional Danish folk tunes for a group of folk dancers in town. Amanda is one of the few of today's young people to learn to speak Danish. <laughs> I learned from the best, right, Bestemore? <laughs> She's a youthful reminder that Tyler was a very Danish settlement a hundred years ago and remains proud of its Danish heritage today. In fact, we picked the perfect time to visit Tyler this summer back-to-back -back weekends of fun, next week's county fair, and this week's Abelskiver Days, a celebration of all things Danish. Exactly what is an Abelskiver? Well, Abelskivers are of a pancake substance that are in the shape of a ball, slightly larger than a golf ball, smaller than a tennis ball. Oops. And they're made in these cast iron pans that have two, four, six, seven 
seven <laughs> little half circles in them and you pour the batter in and then you rotate it as they cook and you eventually get this little fried ball of dough and if it's done right there it's all cooked all the way through and so you don't have to worry about the cream filling that some kids think is pudding but it's really not it's just uncooked batter and you get this delicious little ball of goodness and <laughs> you put syrup on it or powdered sugar and sometimes people do like fruit topping some kids just eat them plain. Abel Skiver Days is the, is the celebration of Danishness, and why not? I mean, even though half the town isn't Danish anymore, you've got to cling to something, and this is a pretty nice thing to cling to. It's seeing a town take pride in, in everything they do. It's one of the things I think that happens here that makes it special is you create your own entertainment. If you're in New York, if you're in Minneapolis, if you're in San Diego, you're, you've got entertainment that you buy to see. And here, you create your own entertainment, and Abel Skiver Days is the best of that in many ways in that the town really steps up and, and celebrates its Danishness, its town heritage, and we love that. And it's so nice to come into that environment. It just feels so good to be a part of uh, the pride and, and the joy of everyone getting together, and it's kind of a, uh, an annual homecoming, if you will, for the Tylerites, and it's a pleasure to be a part of. kind of wondered about those Nissaman you see all over the place. We had some back home in Connecticut too. So I asked the town historian of sorts, newspaper editor, Chuck Hunt. I think there's one right here actually. We have him holding a newspaper. Uh, he's a Nissamund. The Nissamund, the story goes that there's one that lives in every business, one that lives in every home. And if you treat them nice and with respect, then they will bring you good luck. And if you don't, then you're not going to have good luck. And so it's kind of a good luck thing to have a Nisselmund around in Denmark, and we do it here also. In Minnesota, there's over 400 weekly newspapers, and I, it's one of the bigger states for that. Towns in Minnesota feel it is important to have a newspaper as their focus they have for years. This is the Abelskiever issue, for instance. On our front page, even, we start listing. It's the entire schedule, what's going on, when it is going on. And uh, we even go so far as to uh, list who's going to work at Abelskiever Days on what shifts. Uh, here's the Abelskiever baking stand worksheet and people will get this and they'll see even though they know they've signed up now they find out where when and where they're working and what part of it they're doing. Yeah, that's true. They're well, simpler. They're from the uh, then we could get it. Another. It takes a lot of people to put it on. We have a 12 person main committee, but we have a dozen subcommittees that take care of everything from the parade to the baking stand. Um, and every one of those committees has volunteers on it and the work schedule. I we once talked about trying to total up the number of people that were working on it and the number of man hours then by totaling up these hours. I don't think we can do it. It's, it's huge. It's just a lot of work. Each year we have Hide the Wooden Abelskiever and there's a series of clues, usually four of them. One is delivered each day. This year's clues happen to center around our railroad tracks, the fertilizer plant, and the clues were designed in that fashion. But this year's location was a little hard to find. It was right on the end of a railroad spur. And here it is, the wooden apple skier. Once again, it is time for our annual celebration, a chase for the skiver of wooden construction. <laughs> Above the ground is a swell place to look, but first you'll have to get your nose out of a book. Okay, I brought the other two clues, These obviously. lifeguards from the Tyler Pool okay. are working hard okay. to defend their title as champions from last year's Skiver Do Hunt. Do you know about the way that waters flow? The ancient Sumerians could put on a show. But there's more to farming than irrigation. Making a profit involves chemical gumption. So start searching with a view of a field. But if you hear trains in the distance, be sure to yield. The clues are posted each morning on the front door of the Tyler Tribute, the local newspaper. With the clues about chemicals, we're thinking maybe the municipal plant, water, 
there's not a lot of water in Tyler, except for that little bit of rain we had this morning. They have all these growing clues, and it's all about farming. How the city of Tyler grew under our elders' labor. Something that happens during apple skeever days, they hide a solid wooden apple skeever. It's just a round wooden ball that they call a wooden apple skeever. My friends and I just like doing crazy stuff, and so we decided to hunt for it again this year. And it's just it's something that we take part in because it's so, so small town America that someday when we have friends who have never experienced anything like this, we want to tell them about it and, you know, tell them about what happens, you know, in our small town. And that, yes, we actually found the wooden apple skeever. <laughs> small little town and it's kind of a paradise for kids because there is no there's no problems and you just get to you know have your innocence and live every day and not have any worries. Carissa is this year's junior Miss Tyler, a recent high school grad. The Danish side of Tyler is very important in everyone's life even if you're not Danish because obviously our town days are Abelskiver days and that's a Danish food that it's based around. You know, the Danish flag's always flying, there's folk dancing and things like, things even non-Danish people will learn just from living in Tyler. You really, even if you're not Danish, you get a big taste and you know what it's like to be Danish. Apple Scooby Days on Saturday night, there's the main parade, which takes place down Main Street of Tyler. We have a few bands come through, like marching bands. We have a local drum line. What we do for the most part is we take either trucks or vehicles, we support local businesses. We have floats that kind of like Junior Miss float and whatnot. They throw candy out, which I guess is something special to Minnesota, I hear. Um, it's just kind of a way, another way to just bring the community together and kind of have an enjoyable time. I like to think of Adam Matson as the Stevie Winwood of Tyler. He plays every instrument, is a leader of the drum line. He has the lead in this summer's teen musical. He has an awesome music studio in the loft of his family's homestead farm on the outskirts of Tyler. And he knows how to throw an awesome party around a bonfire at night. Um, my dad's 100% Danish. My great grandpa came over, and my great grandma came over, and my great other great great grandma came over, or great grandma, sorry. Um, the other side, my mom's side, she's 50% Danish. So that makes me whatever, one eighth Danish, or whatever it really is. One eighth. Seven eighths, seven, seven, seven fifths, seven fifths. Se I can't, I can't, I'm not. 75%. 75, no it's not. Because then I said it wrong. What I meant to say is my mom is 50% and 25. Uh. Exactly. Okay. I don't care. I'm you're, from, you're a lot, dude. now about the Artera school system, which is very good at educating our youth. <laughs> no, we'll keep out of that. I guess when I think of Tyler, I think of just small town America. You know, what people, all the stereotypes about small towns, it's true. It just so happens that Laura Weering lives at the farm next to the one where I spent my summers. This used to be the Bullison place, and it's now home to the hair salon. <laughs> the thing about, you know, everyone gossips at the beauty shop. <laughs> My mom's a hairdresser, so she owns a beauty shop, and it's out on our farm. And it is true, like, ladies just come into the beauty shop and talk about everything they heard. And so as far as people knowing everything about everyone, it's true. What people think about small towns in that aspect is true. You know, living on a farm, you definitely get a part of the sense that family is important. Because when you're 
when you're on a farm, the whole family's involved. And not saying that kids in town don't have that. And maybe in a small town, the town kids even understand that a lot better than, you know, city kids who live in larger cities. But definitely living in a farm, you get, you get the feeling of working together and hard work. <laughs> I guess a lot of it's centered around work. Actually, something interesting is, you know, right now we're really in need of rain. And some little kids who come to the swimming pool where I work, they talk about, oh, we really need rain. And they, they get kind of worried about it because they know that they've heard their parents talking about it because we really need rain for the crops. And, you know, only in a small town or only from a farm kid would you hear from them, we really need rain. It's not for our lawns, <laughs> it's for the crops. And only in small towns or on a farm would you hear that coming from, you know, a six-year-old child. When the rain comes, it is like a gift from God. <laughs> Honestly, everyone talks about it. You know, just because everyone's so much happier. The farmers are very pleased and my dad is happier at work because the farmers who come in are happier and the farm wives are happy and the kids are happy because their parents are happy and it's just a relief instead of all the dry weather and it feels like you can finally just breathe and be thankful for the rain. <laughs> A ways out along the highway is the Witchern Farm, a historic homestead that's been in the same family since the late 1800s. Judy and her husband Dwayne are the fifth generation. Grandpa's still around. Olden days, well, it was all work. And they have a terrific bunch of kids. Take it off, bend it and pull, and then what do you do? Right there. Tyler is more than just a Danish community. It's more of a farming community. It's built on farming. If the economics for farming isn't good, downtown Tyler isn't very good probably either. Um, my name's Judy Witchern. I'm married to Dwayne Witchern. We have five children. Joseph, who's 21, Douglas, who's 19, <laughs> Kayla, who's 17, and the twins are 10, Jerry and Janelle Witchern. The twins, Jerry and Janelle, remind me most of my summers in Tyler, in harmony with their world, learning about the care of living things, learning to share the load. The farm life is good from raising chickens to doing sweet corn, teaching them a lot about responsibility and working hard and being accountable. Since this year is like a dry year, we're going to be a little bit probably in trouble. It takes a lot of finance, a lot of money to be able to put the crop into the land and to fertilize it. So if we have a really dry year, which we have had this year, I don't know how our yield will be, but it'll be down. And Dwayne always says that you, you keep an extra, you, you save and you keep it because there's always going to be a year that you might not get a crop. So. Dwayne's always looking out for us and looking ahead. So nah. I guess between the fact that we have three sons, we'd really hope and pray that one of our sons would take over the farming someday as we get older so that it stays in the family name of Witchern. Nah. That'd be great. Nah. 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 It sure is no easy task to keep a family farm running these days. I checked in with my shirt tail cousin, Karen Kester, for an update um, on the real estate market. There are quite a few acreages around town that have been abandoned. Acreages are definitely in demand. If we had some that were fixed up and more habitable, I know they would go. It seems everybody wants to get out in the country a little bit. 
Um, just even though Tyler is a rural community, they still like the rural living area. It's great for pets, great for raising families. You're close enough to town to enjoy, get all the basic needs that you are looking for. Um, I wish we had more acreages for sale. This one right here is going to be put on auction uh, within a week or so. I, if, in all honesty, if this were my place, if I was going to buy this acreage right now, I would level the house. <laughs> Just a stone's throw from this abandoned farmstead is the Buell place. It's where Amanda Buell lives. She's getting her entry ready for the Lincoln County Fair, which is coming up in just a couple of days. We're more concentrating on the plant of the health of the entire plant. Now, when I was walking in here earlier, I saw some aphids and some spider mites, and we'll have to take care of that or else they'll reduce Here's her aphids. dad, Don Buell. We grow grain here for food. These are soybeans. This is a soybean plant. These were planted this spring. This plant right now is flowering, and these flowers will become soybean seeds. This is a corn field. These corn plants were planted this spring. Each stalk is from a single, single corn seed. And it's planted in May and harvested in October. And this is the start of a corn ear. And the pollen from this tassel will be shed and fertilize the silk on this ear and each silk leads to a kernel and when all the kernels are fertilized then you'll have a corn ear well when my dad grew up as a teenager on the farm they did not have uh, very much for mecha mechanical equipment they farmed with horses it took a lot more labor it took a lot longer to work a given piece of ground than it would even when i was a teenager and from the time that I've been a teenager until now, uh, the change has been very dramatic. Uh, we can do ten times as much as we did then. In order to enter your pig into competition at the county fair, you must train it to walk on Where your lead. Going, and that's no easy right, feat. I don't know how to get him. <laughs> There's there's not really a way to tell a pig stop. You say hi to the camera, Gordon. Say hi. <laughs> a whole lot of work goes into grooming and all the other preparations. I've never had such clean pigs before washing them the first time. Usually they're all muddy and poopy and... It's time for a little friendly competition this weekend as we present the bounty of everyone's hard work before the judges, friends, and passers-by at the Lincoln County Fair, now in its hundredth year. find out who has the best sheep, horse, heifer, hog, evening gown, bouquet of flowers, fresh fruit preserves, and original artwork. 
This is a hydrangea. This is a first time entrance this year. She has never showed at the fair before, so she's quite excited. She should be. That's a gorgeous flower. I asked her if it bothered her to cut it, and she says, yeah, it really hurt. <laughs> my stargazer, that hurt too. Now here's the thing about the competition at the county fair. It really isn't about who wins and who takes home honorable mention. This is a chance for us to broaden our understanding of how things work and grow. The judges are a treasure trove of knowledge and information. What you might want to do is take a clipper and, and, and trim that uh, off a little bit. Is that for showman? Yes, they may grill you about the inner workings of an internal combustion engine or the proper way to prevent bugs and worms on your cabbage. What bugs are biting your cabbage? Little moth things. Okay, what color are they? Well, that when they grow up, the butterflies, they're white. But they do try and give you the answer whenever they can. And it, and it looks like, you ever done any sewing? Mom ever doing any sewing? Ever seen that kind of that, that inside lining of, of clothing? It looks like that. And in the spring, when you put the new plants out, you just lay that over the top of cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli, and then secure the sides so it doesn't blow away in the wind. And as the crop grows, this stuff will just grow with it. And it and actually will cover. The sun shines through, it rains through, but guess what doesn't get through? The bugs. The butterflies. And if you keep the butterflies off the cabbage leaf, they can't lay eggs. And out eggs, there's no cabbage worm. So just for next year, think about that. And, it's smooth. and any sharp edges, if you just sand them, just so people won't snag their clothing on them. See, now feel this. This one's done pretty good. Under here, get that too. The same here. And wherever you got a potential sharp edge that someone could hit with their leg or clothing, just sand it. It's really pretty easy to do. Now there's plenty of sights to see, but none works up the crowd quite like the thrills of mud racing over at the grandstand. was constructed from a Vogue pattern out of 100% polyester for Hannah Jorgensen's senior prom night. She chose this material for its smooth silk feel and unique oriental look to add a little flair to her prom dress. Jade plans to wear this dress to concerts, weddings, church, and parties. Jade enjoys playing basketball, volleyball, and running in track. She also enjoys drawing, doing crafts, babysitting, watching movies, and hanging out with her friends. Her escort is Garrett Weber, who is also a 4-H member. Her entire dress cost her less than $20. What a deal! She wore her dress to Palm and also Tyler Area's Junior Miss program this summer. Tonight, Laura is escorted by Andrew Carmony not in 4-H. <laughs> Here's everything you need to know and more about rooster, pullet, hen. And also the, uh, she has got excellent undercolor. That You want that real smoky gray color. It's got a good peak home. I'd like to see a little more width in the head uh, he's just a little too, a little, little fine feature here, but I'll let you go ahead and put him back. Champion breeding pen. This is an outstanding pen of chickens right here. This will compete well at the state fair. So uh, congratulations to all of you. Uh, we're going to go with the young lady's white gill right here, a gill that we threw a big frame, long body gill. Uh, for many participants, this all can be very stressful. But for someone like Adam Matson, it's not the main event. I enjoy doing it, but it's not really my profession. I'm much more musically gifted than farming gifted. I really don't think Adam will end up on the farm just simply because, like he said, he's very musically gifted, and I know he has expressed interest in coming back to Tyler and being a music teacher, but 
Living on the farm, probably not. And if it, if it was, it'd be more of a hobby farm than anything. Uh, the last one we talked about, uh, guilt that looks good from the side. Uh, long body, there is some people that, you know, want to want to leave and never look back. And then there's a lot of people in my class who, a lot of farmers, a lot of farmers' kids in my class who want to take over for the family farm or farm around here. I don't know. There's, there's many people in my class that I could anticipate staying here. Some of us, a little sentimental towards Tyler, I guess. It's, I've always liked it. It's been a good place for me to grow up, and so I just hope it'll continue to be a good place for people to grow up. Back in the 1880s, Tyler was just another whistle stop on a train ride heading west. A place where you could stake a claim, husband a hectare of land for so many years, and eventually the farmland became yours. Friends of a Feather passed the word about good spots to stake a claim, and soon the Danish immigrant community began to burgeon in this place called Tyler. Well, I understand they came over to America because they had a, they couldn't make a living anymore in Denmark. It was so poor over there. This is my aunt in yeah. Danish, Tanta oh Edna Shriver. She would like to see his pictures. <laughs> we call her Dordy. She's one of seven children born to my Danish immigrant grandparents. And I guess Minnesota is quite a bit like Denmark in uh, temperature and everything and that's what they say. But when somebody first started to come here then others would hear about it or, or they'd have their relatives come too and so on. They'd send word to them <laughs> to come to Minnesota. This was a safe haven for the, the Danish immigrants. And we see that in letters from the immigrants who wrote back to their brother, their sister, niece, nephew in Denmark and said, I know this safe haven in Tyler, Minnesota where you, know, you can come over here and make a new life. They came to America because they wanted something better and it didn't mean they wanted to recreate Denmark. It just was a safety net for them while they assimilated into America. When we were growing up, my mother and dad lived on a farm two miles from Tyler, and we were seven children, and we spoke Danish. So when we started school, I didn't know anything on English. We had to learn English. We went to a parochial school where we had half a day. The first half of the day was Danish, and that went fine, and the teacher was wonderful. But after we had our noon lunch, I couldn't understand a word she said because we had to learn English, and everything was on English. <laughs> so it was kind of hard, but eventually we learned it. But at home, we only spoke Danish. We didn't know anything about language it was we just spoke danish and went to a danish school and a danish church and downtown the shops were danish everybody spoke danish so that's how it was at home at, at the house here's my mom harriet Sorensen, doherty's younger sister her friends call her tula luckily my mother knew how to cook danish food that's how she was brought up so we had good home-cooked Danish food. Soy soap and apple skiver and roigre and some of these things that we still like. For myself, I am so happy that that happened in my family because not only do I have the richness of the American culture and all the good things about America, I also have that feeling of the, the wonderful things that there were in, in Denmark that that my parents and my grandparents shared with me. And we continue those traditions today. Another lifelong Tylerite, one from my generation, is educator and historian Ricky Bly, who lives right next door to the Danish Community Center 
which was established by the first Danes in Tyler, a place called Danabo. The complex of Danabo began because they wanted to uh, create a folk school atmosphere for a place for the immigrants to gather, especially the, the young, uh, probably teenage immigrant that needed to find their place in America. Danabo was just really our second home. We felt so uh, at ease and, in, and involved in the Danish, first of all, the little Danish school, Berna School, which is a, little, a children's school. And we liked it. We liked it singing in the Danish language and having gymnastic, go to the gymnasium and have Danish gymnastics, stretching and exercise and some running and some floor mat exercises and so on. You got very limber doing it. And to this day, people can't believe that I can bend over and touch my hands to the floor. <laughs> which I've always been able to do. Oh, on Friday afternoons it was so nice because the Aventure man would come. He lived close by. Aventure, a fairy tale man. And he would recite Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales to us and put so much expression into it. We just loved it. Well, the fairy tale man was my grandfather and he had come from Denmark, but it was very exciting when he would come to the school. I can hear him telling Rumpelstiltskin, and he would stamp his foot, and Rumpelstiltskin was so angry, and he would just stamp, I thought his foot was going to China. And one time he actually threw an umbrella and way up in the area, he had all the motions and, and the voice, yeah, it was a thrill to, to have him. We took it completely as entertainment, but unbeknownst to us, it must have also inspired us and set good habits and good moral values to us to help others and be kind to others and make the best of what you have. I think I hadn't really thought about it before, but I, th I think we did get some good th things out of it. And then we went to Sunday school, which was also in the Danish language, and then we'd been confirmed in Danish in the, in the Danish church. And I was lucky enough to be also married in that Danish church to a Dane, but this Dane came from another state. I think it was a very good place to grow up and, and learn about neighbors and other people and how to get along together. What happened at, at Danabode is, I believe, a common linkage to what we see with all immigrants, at least to the immigrants who want to hang on to their culture and to the, the things that enriched the culture that they left. It, it's a good thing. It, it doesn't mean that you're any less American or any less patriotic. It just enriches our lives and enriches the lives of all the people who have come from all the different countries around the world to make America their home. Tyler celebrated its 100th uh, anniversary back in 1987, so we're actually working up to our 125th and a hundred years ago it was just you know unsettled it was a place to come get a fresh start in life get a fresh look do, do, do something new um, that's the way I feel about it and that's the way I think America was built and I think if you come out here into the rural area well, you're gonna find lots of small towns that still have that same kind of feeling where people work together you know everybody um, you hurt when somebody else hurts and you celebrate when somebody else celebrates and you have some of that in big cities and you have your friends in that but in Tyler you know we would have to go a little ways to find somebody in Tyler that I don't know. If uh, this tent were a pile of sand he would just fit on top. <laughs> Some kids stay here, some kids find opportunities, they work here, 
you know, I can name a lot of them, but uh, a lot of them go off to college and don't come back. I mean, they're, they're gone, basically, and my three kids are examples of that. None of my three live here. They all went away to school. They're all living in other towns, other places, looking for opportunities. I don't believe that Tyler will change all that much. I mean, we are growing, but it's kind of a very slow process. I really don't think it's going to be a boom by any means. I think it's, we're just going to kind of keep gradually growing. There'll still be farmers. They'll still have the very close-knit community. It's just, I can't imagine Tyler being anything else than what it is. It's a small school, and it is a small town, so it, it really just depends on, I don't know, the economy of the whole world if Tyler will grow. I don't, yeah. <laughs> you don't have a crystal ball. Right. <laughs> eventually, I would suppose Tyler will be like all the other small towns and eventually may succumb to the pressures of the big city and, and uh, we're, we're going to fight it as long as we can, however. But, but our crops are looking good in this area. And, uh, the weather has been cooperative, and so it's, things are so far shaping up and looking pretty fair. Well, it's almost time to say so long to Tyler for yet another summer. And just as seasons pass, so do our friends and family. We dearly miss several of the participants who contributed to this project. One of them, Amanda's bestimore, Agnita Buell. Luckily, Amanda continues and carries the tune. Just last summer, my Tante Doherty passed on. She was like a second mom to me. There's so much we never did ask our parents that we wished we had now when, when we were trying to figure it all out. Which leaves things a bit lonely for my mom who's now living a thousand miles away in the Green Mountains. Now that I live in an area that the Danish culture and language is not known at all, I look back in my, the old days, and I think in a lot about it, how we spoke a language and, and lived in a certain way in, in the community that everyone seemed to get along with each other and we'd help out each other. And I learned that language which stays with me. And I'm very lonesome for it now because I don't have anyone who can speak it with me anymore. They say all the world is a song and these tunes do drift through my dreams. Favel to Tyler and so long Summer's song.